Praise God. Um, just want to welcome you all to uh, our service today and those of you that are watching us online, uh, God bless you and welcome to our service. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Now I'll, 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 I'll go straight into uh, the teaching of today and uh, I just want to talk about Abraham again. And uh, and uh, I want to talk about the life of this man. We know that Abraham was uh, a man of faith. We learn the life of faith from him, amen. And um, I thought we could learn a few more things from this man uh, in his um, in his life as he goes towards the end of his life. But uh, actually, not his life, but the life of his wife, who in this chapter twenty-three. Uh, is uh, is now uh, uh, died, and uh, so Abraham goes through a bit of a, uh, a, a, a sad spell uh, on the loss of his of his wife. So for those of you that um, are following us online, you can turn to Genesis chapter twenty three, and we're gonna read uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the verses from verse one to verse twenty. From to verse 20, on, on for those of you that are here, you can read that on the screen, but there's no point of the camera uh, pointing at that because yeah, it's too small. So just turn your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 23, starting from verse 1, and I'll, I'll read it, and you, you, you can hear me if you don't uh, up there. There might be somebody at the door. Uh, I don't know if they are, they are coming here for us, but... Okay, so verse 1 says... Uh, Sarah lived to be a hundred and twenty-seven years old. She died at Kerias Ava, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abram went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Then Abram rose from, the, from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites. He said, I am a foreigner and a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so I can bury my dead. The Hittites replied to Abraham, Sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of your tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. Then Abraham rose and bowed down before the people of the land, the Hittites. He said to them, If you are willing to let me bury my dead, then listen to me and intercede with Ethron, the son of Zohar, on my behalf. So he will sell me the cave of Machpera, which belongs to him, and is at the end of this of his field. Ask him to sell it to me for the full price as a burial site among you. Ebron the Hittite was sitting among his people, and he replied to Abraham in the hearing of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of his city. No, my lord. He said, listen to me. I give you the field and I give you the curve that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of my people. Bury your dead. Again, Abram bowed down before the people of the land. And he said to Ephron in their hearing, listen to me. If you will, I will pay the price of the field. Accept it from me, so I can bury my dead there. Ezron answered Abraham, Listen to me, my lord. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. But what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham agreed to Ephron's terms and weighed out for him the price he had named in the hearing of the Hittite. 400 shekels of silver, according to the weight 
current among the Americans. So apron fields in Mecapella near Mamre, both the field and the curve in it, and all the trees within the borders of the field was deeded to Abraham as his property in the presence of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. Afterward, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the curve in the field of Mancapera near Mamre, which is at Hebron in the land of Canaan. So the field and the curve in it were deeded to Abraham by the Hittites as a burial site. Amen. Amen. Detailed story of the, the funeral of Abraham's wife, Sarah. And I read this and I wondered why we were given all these details. But I thought um, we could learn a few things from this. And I just want to spend the next uh, uh, few minutes just to teach a few things from this. I had actually prepared this message with a view that there will be some, some young people here as well. Because some of the things that I'm going to say that I saw from this would encourage uh, all of us, particularly the young people. It's a story of uh, Abraham losing his wife. And the wife was 127 years old. Mm -hmm. Amen. And uh, I think Abraham was 10 years older than Sarah. Wasn't he? So he would have been, Abraham would have been 137 uh, years. And uh, at this stage, uh, Isaac then would have been 37 years old. Because Abraham had Isaac at the age of 100. Was that correct? Yeah. So these people lived long. <laughs> 127 years old. Sarah lived. And then she died. And um, so the, the uh, story starts off with um, quite a sad uh, moment of uh, the death of his wife. And... Uh, it's remarkable that um, Abraham, this is the only time, I mean, recorded in the book of Genesis, I checked that one, that Abraham wept. Abraham had gone through quite a few moments of difficulty in his life. Remember he had uh, uh, disappointment with, uh, with his nephew Lot. Uh, he had uh, a heartbreak about Ishmael, his son, being sent away. And uh, we also know some of the things that we've looked at uh, where he was asked to offer Isaac as well. All those kind of things. But none of those situations told us that Abraham wept. This is the only time we are told Abraham wept. And we understand because this condition involved death, isn't it? And we know that when death happens, you know, we will all cry. Because death um, takes away from us uh, something that is so loved, the loved ones. We just feel that they've been death. Death, you know, feels like it has just taken them away from our arms and from our hearts. And therefore people grieve. And people, and people, 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 um, anguish over the loss of um, of them. So we we can understand uh, that Abraham could, you know, you know, it's recorded that he wept um, because of of death involved. The grief always brings that kind of feelings upon upon our lives up to this day, and it's important that Christians as well. We know we understand um, the if impact of death on our lives, but the Bible says that don't have that scripture. It says that we who are of hope don't grieve at those who do not have hope, because we know that death is just but a transition uh, into uh, into glory. But Abraham had uh, that um, heartache. 
of of losing uh, his, his 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 wife in, in those few sculptures, and um, it, it is in their in their custom. Um, it's still their custom in the Jewish custom that somebody would uh, when your loved one dies you would actually be given time to spend with them and you mourn you mourn over them uh you're given time to 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 be with them i don't know whether it's still it's a custom in the in a persian culture as well is it that you you know maybe a night before you know you hold a bit of a vigil you are just left to to yourself and them but certainly in a jewish culture that is something that happens so this is something that was expected. So Sarah would have been put in a tent and Abraham went in there and the Bible says that and he wept over his wife. He wept over his wife. So it was a time of, of, of anguish uh, to, to him. Um, but, um, you know, more than that, as the story uh, progresses, we see some other things in the life of this man. You know Abraham and we are trying to learn a few things um, as he himself comes towards the end of his life you know he is very old now and now he's ended up being a widow or a widower so um, yeah so that bit of, of, of him uh, you know are around there then we see in um, verse 3 it says, and Abraham arose from, the, from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites. He said, I am a foreigner and a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so I can bury my dead. The Hittites replied to Abraham, Sir, Listen to us. You are a mighty prince amongst us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. Now, one thing I like about, and this is where the title of, of uh, my message actually uh, uh, begins, the life of the man of faith. You know, and I think it's important to know that, you know, irrespective of who you are, uh, how strong you are in the faith, you know, the experience of Abraham with regards to death will always come. But we see in verse 3 here something that Abraham does remarkably. The Bible says, and then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife. This sig sig signifies that life has to go on. Abraham realizes that despite the loss of his wife, there is still a promise to be fulfilled. That God had spoken to him uh, over his life. Abraham basically is saying, I must soldier on, on the promise, as the promise is still on. And he who has promised, is faithful so he rose from before uh, his dead and we are looking at sometimes in our Christian I mean this is this is quite uh, uh, a heavy moment for him because it involves death but um, in our Christian lives the life of um, you know uh, of faith we will experience situations that really bring us down Amen? Where we feel our hopes are dashed. Where we feel, uh, you know, we are really at rock bottom. You are still a man of God. Amen? You are still a woman of God. You are still a Christian. You are just in that circumstance where you feel you are rock bottom. But listen to what Abraham has done here. We must underline that word. Abraham Ross. Amen. Mm -hmm. Abraham did what? Rose. He rose. That's a key word in our Christian walk. That's what I'm saying. The life of the man of faith. We always 
rise. Amen? We rise. And we walk away from things that are looking desperate, things that are looking just dismal, things that are looking like it's the end of life. It's not. We rise. Amen? We rise from the dead situations. And not only did he do that, the Bible says he spoke to the Hittites. Now the Hittites represents the heathens who were in the land. Remember, Hebron is part of the land that has been promised to Abraham. That is, that is uh, Israel. Hebron is, is that mountain. And uh, so literally Abraham is on the land that God has promised him. It is, he has the right to that land because he knows God has promised him that land. God has promised descendants that land. He is literally, his wife has died on the land that God has promised him. However, he's living amongst heathens because in that land, the land was not unoccupied. The land was occupied by all these guys. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, all the heathens, the people who were doing all sorts of things. That's why when the children of Israel left Egypt, God told them, when you go into the land, the land that flows with milk and honey, you're going to have to fight and disperse those people. Don't be part of them, engage with them, teach them new ways, and, and, and get your land. Because the land was occupied. It was not just on its own. It was not just a house built and you are walking into it. They had to go in there and, and deal with those people. So Abraham and, and Sarah had lived with these people, amongst these people. And therefore, and these people, they had to some extent the right to to the land because that's that's where they are farming. That's where they are. You can see from the description, this man called uh, Ethron, he actually even knew the boundaries of his field, and Abraham himself knew. That's why he was telling. As we go to to we'll look at those the, the, the verses that we just laid, he says he says, please speak to Ethron to give me that land where the cave is, going all the way to those part of the trees there and. These people had divided the land to themselves. Yeah? In the other ways, we call them what? Uh, encroachers. <laughs> and, and in certain parts of the world, this is very common. You could have a piece of land and you pay for it and you've got title this. And there are several people who still got the same title this for the same land. So you've got to go through a process and check. When you start building, another guy shows up <laughs> wanting to build the same sense of God title this. So, encroachers are always there. So every time in certain parts of the world, when you buy a piece of land, the first thing you want to check is there are no encroachers on the land. So these guys were there and they had already divided the land to themselves. So Abraham respects that. Even though he knows he's got the promise of God, that is the land, but he respects that. And he has lived among these people. So he goes to speak to them. But you see, this is the man who's grieving. Uh, and, um, and, but he has to rise and engage with these people and begin to talk to them. And you can see already the way Abraham is talking to them that this is the man of diplomacy. He's the man of uh, 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 protocol. You know, he didn't just say to them, Oh, you uh, crutches of the land move out of here. I want to, to bury my, my wife. This is God's land. He has promised to me and my son Isaac, we are about to take over this land. He speaks to them nicely. You know when you know who you are. Yeah? When you know who you are, you know you belong to God. God is on your side. There's no need engaging with the heavens, the worldly people. In the world, the way. Sometimes we Christians, that's where we mess it up. We mess it up with the people of the world. There is always a way to talk to them. 
there is always a way to engage with them. And there is always a way to have dialogue with them, despite us knowing our rights. You know, I can just give you some examples, for you know, in this part of the world here, where there are certain rules and laws of the land which appear to restrict even the preaching of the gospel. There are certain things you need to observe. There are certain things you just can't do. Um, honestly speaking, they are, they are frustrating to Christians because we know that the, the gospel is free and the gospel should be preached. And then you come into this place. Maybe not even here in England, but we talk about certain countries where you can't even shout the name of Jesus. You know, God has not called us to fight battles in the flesh. We are meant to fight the battles in the spirit. And there's always a way to engage the systems of the world. And we see Abraham doing that very, very well with the high tides. And this is the man who's even grieving. He goes to them and he says, Then Abraham arose from the beside his dead wife and spoke to the high tides and said, I'm a foreigner. Look at, first of all, the way he describes himself. I am a foreigner here because you know, he found those people there. So he describes himself as a foreigner and a stranger among you. That is important. He let them know that he is not part of them. He is a stranger, a stranger among you. Sell me some of the property for the battle site so I can bury my dead. The height has replied to Abraham, Sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince amongst us. Bury your dead at the choicest of your place. Look at what they've told him now. Go choose whatever you want to bury your dead and do that. Now you must, if you go into the details of these people, particularly the Jebusites, the Hittites, you know, you remember Caleb and Joshua, the team that went into the land to go and spy. These guys were not nice. <laughs> they were rough people. They were giants, even some of them. I mean, Caleb and Joshua and the other uh, team, the other people, Caleb and Joshua were only two who came back and said, even though they are giants and big and they look scary, they don't look like people you can sit down and have a proper conversation. <laughs> <laughs> they are those kind of people. However, our God is able. Amen. The others just said, oh no. What you said, Joshua and Caleb, is very true. These people, you can't have a conversation with them. Unless you just want to be smashed. So let's just forget it. Let's stay here in the wilderness. They obligated the promise. But thank God for Joshua and Caleb. So, so Abraham here we see has used his experience to engage with these people. And he has obtained favor with them. Amen. Look at the way that says Abraham. You are actually a prince amongst us. Go and uh, choose the piece of land that you want. And, uh, and 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 uh, bury your, your wife. But you see, coming back to that way, Abraham rose. Let me just emphasize a few things here, beloved. The Bible says that the righteous man who fall seven times and rise how many times? Seven times and rise. We have to rise. If we're going to be men and women of faith, we need to learn to rise. Amen. 
we rise up. As a matter of fact, we just learned um, a few weeks ago that God revealed himself to Abraham as the God of destruction. Amen. Abraham had already experienced that this God that I serve resurrects things. So even though I am at the lowest of the lowest, God is still able to cause my life to carry on. We see David who also passed through similar kind of situations of difficulty say these words. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And what did David do? He carried on. Abraham was exactly in the same place. Because death is a dark hour, isn't it? It's a dark hour. In that tent, over his dead wife, he was going through a dark hour. We always consider death to be that point. But we Christians, when we go through moments like that, it may not be death. We should always remember that it's not a point to stop that we must rise and carry on. This is what John said about, uh, Jesus said about himself. In John chapter 8, verse 12, he said, Jesus spoke again to the people, and he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Abraham knew right there that despite the dark hour of death, there is light, the light of God that shines. Abraham recalls God as the God of resurrection, that this is not the end of his life. There's still a promise to be fulfilled. There's Isaac still to grow and possess the light because God is the light. Amen. Amen. And we saw in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 19 where the Bible says he considered that God was able to raise men even from the dead. Hence, figuratively speaking, he, he would receive Isaac back. So Abraham at this stage already had an experience that God can still turn situations around. And therefore for him it was not about trying to bring Sarah back to life, but it was about him rising up from, the, from that situation and carrying on. We have seen even today, you know, in, our, in, 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 the, in the life today, how sometimes death can devastate people. Yeah? There's a certain, uh, uh, you know, movie series that my wife and I are watching. Okay, and in that series, there's this guy who lost his mother. And uh, it has devastated him so much that he has failed to gather himself together. And he has just become, uh, he's given himself to alcohol, drugs, and all those kind of things. He just become a completely <coughs> different person. And we see these things do happen. People end up in mental hospitals because... Uh, they are, they are bros. They can't handle the anguish of, of, of death. They can't see this light that Jesus is talking about. That I am the light of the world. Amen. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness again. But he will have the light of life. And this is the light that Abraham somehow again, miraculously, in that tent, in the moment of the dark hour of death, Abraham sees that light of God. And he arose from the body of his dead wife, came out of the, the, the tent and says, I want to follow 
this light. Amen. Beloved, this is what the life of a man of faith is all about. That in the moment you're going through the darkest, darkest moment, remember John 8, 12, where Jesus says, I am the light of the earth. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Never walk in darkness. You could go through what David is saying. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil. That means we will walk through that valley at one point or another. Amen? But we should always remember there will be light because Jesus is light. Jesus is light. And, and Jesus says, whoever follows me. So we have followed him. Whether you experience moment of grief, you experience moment of disappointment, you are still a follower of Jesus, and therefore you have in you the light of life. And that light, when we focus on it in those moments, it causes you to see it. And that's what made Abraham come out of that, that hour. To follow that light. He says he arose from his dead to follow that light. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. That's the life of the man of faith. He falls, he passes through the valley of the shadow of death, but he walks right through it because he always has light in him. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. And Abraham as well, through his experience of Isaac, and knowing that God is the God of the resurrection, knew that death after all is a temporary obscuring of the light. That's what death absolutely does. Death makes people want to see that all oh, hope is gone. There's nothing else to live for. That's the ploy of the enemy. Jesus is the light. First Corinthians chapter, chapter 15, verse 55 says, Where all death is your victory, where all death is your sting, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And if we, if we, we as we are praying that, you know, Abraham was the, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the metaphor of the father, then we realize that actually um, Abraham, in his own experience with God, would have understood that death has no sting at all, and therefore he could walk away from it, arise and push on with what God has called him to do. So the man of faith is the one who lifts up his eyes, amen, and looks beyond the shadow and sees the light still shining, and he says to these people, hey you people, I am a stranger in this land and I'm a sojourner amongst you. Can I have a place to bury my wife? He says. So Abraham learns the art of fixing his life or his eyes to Jesus. This is what we are told in, in Hebrews chapter 12 verse, 12, verse 2. He says, fixing eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we should never ever in our walk of faith forget that our eyes must always be fixed, fixed on him. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Now there's something interesting as well that we see happen in Abraham speaking to the people uh, in the land in verse 5. So the high replied to Abraham 
Sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince amongst us. But you are dead in the choices of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. So you can see Abraham to some extent now has acquired some kind of favor amongst these people. And this is one point that I wanted to, to emphasize to not just the young people but to everyone and to all of us. This speaks of the testimony Abraham had amongst these heathens. The testimony Abraham had among these heathens. That the time Abraham lived amongst them with his wife Sarah, he, he accrued so much respect amongst these heathens to the point where they are even calling him, you are a prince amongst us. Beloved, keeping your testimony among heathens will bring you to this point where the heathens respect you. Pagans or heathens or people who don't believe in the things that we believe in, the people who get frustrated by our faith, the people who see our faith as foolishness, they hate us. That's what the Bible says. Jesus says to, uh, to the Father, Father, um, I am keeping these people in this world. The world that hates them. I wish I could take them out of the world, but no, they are staying in this world. Jesus said this world hates us. And we all have that kind of experience in our Christian life. At work, in our families, how your own faith will cause you to be hated. When Abraham moved into that land, when we look at the behavior of these people, they knew who he was. He was the man of God. And they did not like him. But what made these people turn around and call him prince amongst us? I don't think it's just a question of them grieving with him. Because you see sometimes death, even your enemies will come around and try to comfort you. Death has got a certain way of... <laughs> <laughs> of even your enemies showing up at the funeral of your loved ones. And people say, you know, I don't know the country that we come from. You hardly hear bad things about people who have died. Even the virus of offenders. The eulogy is always a very nice thing that they write about them. But I believe I want to believe that the only reason why these heathens, these pagans, would address Abraham as you are prince amongst us is because of his integrity. Amen. Because of his integrity. With time, they started moving from not liking him to saying this man is different. A man of his wife. A man that has respect. I mean, he was old. His wife was old too. They would have seen how this man would have been caring for his wife, cutting his wife around, how he spoke, how he did things, how all this, they were looking. It was completely different from the life of violence, vile words, talk, and all those kind of things that they did. And they addressed him. You, this man, leave this man. You know, in life, when you get to a point where even your enemies are coming to defend you. When they see some other enemies trying to harm you, they say, don't touch him. Don't touch him. Don't touch this man. He's a good man. <laughs> you see, your, your life amongst the heathens is speaking for itself. And that's one thing I want to say to the young people. You young people who are here and those of you that are watching this. I know there is peer pressure in this world. Peer pressure is at every level. This world is designed to box us in. This world is designed to put us in its mold. That's what the world is about. The Greek word for this world is cosmos. Means 
cosmos is a system that cannot be relied on. That's what this world is. It depends on the mechanisms of man to get it going. That's why economies crash. That's why the very people we, we trusted let us down. This world is, 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 is sinking sand. It's shaky. But it's also full of people who don't like those who believe in God. And therefore we don't walk amongst these people seeking favor from them. Our favor comes from God. It's God himself who works on these people. Like the Bible says, and Jesus grew up in wisdom and in stature. And he had the favor of both God and men. Somebody said Jesus was the richest baby ever to be born. And it's true. Because even those who had not yet believed in him, they brought gifts of God and, and ma and, and, and all this kind of uh, frankincense. Ever since Jesus, there's not been any other baby who has had gifts of God. Jesus was not poor. He <laughs> was very rich. Even, even, even the princesses who are born today, people just take flowers and cards. Amen. Amen. But you see, this world is not designed to give us favors. Our favor comes from God. It's God who works amongst his people. All we need to do is we have to live among these people as people of God. That's it. Isn't it, son? Amen. That's all we need to do. We have to live amongst them. And that's what Abraham and Sarah did. To the point now, these people are saying, you are a prince amongst us. Tell us whatever you want, we'll give it to you. What a testimony. What a testimony. Young people, stick to your standards. Keep your integrity. Don't give in. Don't, don't, don't do things like others are doing them. The same people will turn around and mock you. And they will mock the name of the Lord. Abraham and Sarah, from this testimony, tells us they never let go down. They never heard this man in that camp say anything against God. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful testimony. It's okay. And it is well when Christians come and leave you. We expect to do that to each other. Don't we? Yes, we do. That's why the Bible says, of what good is it when you are praised for what you are supposed to be doing anyway. But when God moves a heathen to come and bless you, then you know the favor of God has hit. And also heathens don't just do things like that. They have seen something about your life. But when we mess up our integrity, the same heathens they will come and speak to us. I can say the same thing about young men and women that are getting looking to get married. Keep your integrity. Keep your integrity. Because the things you do now, they will matter when you get married to that same man, that same woman. Keep your integrity. Abraham, they said, Sir, you are a prince. Listen, sir. You are a mighty prince amongst us. So young people, don't just complain or everybody else as the world is trying to squeeze us and trying to influence itself amongst you. You can still live a life of integrity. In our attitudes, in our lives, in everything. Amen. Even if the surrounding area is offensive or is different or we are different to them because that's how they look at us do not conform the Hittites are heathens in other words these are worldly people 
Abraham had lived amongst them for a while. He had not compromised himself with their way. Hallelujah. And that's why he says, look, I came here. I'm a stranger among you. I am, I am a sojourner. I am a foreigner. I'm just asking. But I said, wow, you've been a different foreigner. Let me just say something about you. You could be in this country, whichever country you are in, and you are a foreigner. Live righteously. Don't break the laws. Don't cut corners. No matter what. Amen. God knows. Amen. God knows. In my, in my position as a pastor and as, as a leader in our community, there are so many pressures that you see people going through and you see them cutting corners. Just yesterday we had a big meeting here with the young people and I listened to one man who came. Uh, he's now a pastor in Oxford and, and, and he, he was put in prison for, for being wrongly accused for three months. I heard him speak. You know, you were sharing, you were talking to me. And I said, sir, that would have been very, very hard. Because one of the most difficult things in life is to be accused for things you have not done. And even to be put in prison. And there are so many people in prison today who, have, who are innocent. But you see, God knows. He says, I knew God knew. And up until time came and I was taken out. I was, I was told to come out. But I learned things that God wanted me to teach. To teach me in that time. So things like that will happen. But when you are in those places, do not compromise. Do not compromise. So that was a great testimony uh, from the, the heathens about Abraham. Look at the scriptures I've got here about what we should. For those of you that are following online, we're looking at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Not the worship we do every Sunday, you have very good music. There's bigger worship out there. Amen. The Bible says, and you shall know them by their fruits. That's how the disciples were known. They were known by their fruits. Not crusades. Not flyers. Not all these things that we do. Christian life speaks for itself. Wherever we are. Integrity. Faithfulness. Dependency. Truthfulness. Honest. Abraham did it amongst the most difficult people. Which people are you living amongst? Which people are you living amongst? He lived amongst the most difficult people. And yet they called him why prince amongst us. Verse 2 of Romans chapter 12. Do not conform to the patterns of this world. Amen. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen. Do not be what? That's the underlining word. Do not be conformed. Beloved, if we conform, we, we lose it. John chapter 17 verse 13 says, I'm coming to you now. This is Jesus now praying for us. And he's praying to the Father. I'm coming to you now. But I say these things what, while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Where? In the world, amongst the people who do not like us. Hey, Jesus, you are leaving us here, and you know these people don't like us. And you are saying, we will have the joy. How are you going to have the joy? Let's read it. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Don't be surprised when the world hates you, young people. When your friends begin calling you, who do you think you are? 
this very this very movie my wife and, and I are watching there was this boy who has been influenced by the, the other friends and, and and this boy now he has turned around he's a good boy and now he's struggling to wed off uh, the others because now when when he goes back to school when he goes back to school they are telling him they are telling him who do you think you are why, why have you changed why are you, why are you not smoking with us why are you not drinking with us and he's telling them look I've stopped doing all these kind of things and they're saying no you can't stop you hate us and you like your parents you hate us uh, you 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 hate us now and you like your parents right you feel that with all their you know whatever all those kind of things <laughs> pressure this world will hate us when you begin to live right even your sweetest friend will hate you but there we go Jesus is praying it's there he said it in black and white this world will do what who hate us so Christians let's stop this idea of going about whinging when people who don't believe are saying all bad things against us and we, we're not here to be loved, we're here to do to live the life of Christ. Abraham would have had that in the camp in Hebron. And then Jesus goes on to say, For I've given them your word, and the world and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. So we are not of this world. That's why we look like a fish out of the pond. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, oops, but that you protect them from the evil one. Amen. He'll do what? He'll protect us from the evil one, from the, from, from the hateful environment. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth, as you sent it. So I also uh, send them into the world. I've sent them into the world. For them... I sanctify thyself, myself, that they too may be fully sanctified. Amen. That's what it's all about. So we should not, we should not be pressed. We will be pressed, but we must maintain the substance that we are made of inside of us. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter five verse fourteen says. You, what did Jesus say in John chapter 18? I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me has my light. Now, what did Jesus say now? He's saying, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is exactly what Abraham brought in that camp of Hebron. He brought the light. Because that place was full of wickedness. And they began to see this light of Abraham shining a little bit, a little bit, in the following year, in the following year. By the time it came to this situation where he lost his wife, that light was so broad that they began to testify of it. And they say, you are a prince amongst us. What could you even do without you? Do you think these people even wanted him to carry on with the journey? I don't think so. I think they wanted him to stay. He had brought change to the whole place. Our testimonies where I've brought change to the environment where I am. And people testify. That ever since some came to this place, we have seen this change. And I go back, I'm thinking, wow, that's the testimony. And people don't want you to go. They want you to stay around. They want you to stick around. That's the testimony that Abraham brought in the camp of Hebron up until his wife died. The light of the world. Jesus is the light. But now he's saying we are the light of the world. If we try to hide our light, people, then the less of the world is in darkness. Those hiders saw that light of Abraham. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So, so that's another, another life of the man of faith. What have we looked at first? The man of faith always rises from negative circumstances. Abraham arose. We grieve. 
he went through that difficult time, a time of, of, of the dark hour, of the death of his wife, like uh, David also went through the, 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 the valley of the shadow of death. But he knew there was a light in me. He raised his eyes and fixed them on Jesus. So the man of faith rises. We rise. And we soldier on in the strength of the Lord. The man of faith keeps his integrity, keeps his testimony. Whether people are seeing or people are not seeing, you keep your integrity. Because particularly among the people who are heathens, it brings a testimony. Hallelujah. And then we see one other last thing for the rest of the verses from verse 7 to verse 20. We, we read this already. This is where now we go into this. It sounds like a, it sounds like a, a negotiation. <laughs> Abraham is saying, look, find this man, uh, Ephron, who owns that land and that curve there. I will pay for it. Wow, this man is amazing. He wants to honor his wife and put her to rest in this beautiful curve. And he's saying, I'm ready to pay anything for it. Who is the owner of this land? Give it to me. I will pay for it. And look at that conversation. And they're still begging him. They are begging the man, no, 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 no. Abraham, you are the prince amongst us. You can't pay for this. You can't pay for this. Abraham says, no, I want to pay for it. You know one lesson I saw from here? I saw one thing. Abraham knew who these people were. And this is one thing we Christians should always remember. And I've experienced this in my own life. The Bible says, out of the mouth of the enemy, no good shall come out of it. Sometimes the enemy can come to us and pretend and put things before us that look very good. We must be very careful before we take them. Because tomorrow, the enemy will come and on claim right to those things. Abraham was offered free space of your own choice to bury your wife. He says, listen, thank you very much. Thanks, but no thanks. I'll pay for it. I'll pay for it. Oh, no, no, Abraham. No, 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 no. It's free. Even Epsilon begins to argue, no, this is not going to happen. Just have it. He says, no, no, no. I'll pay for it. In fact, I'll pay for every bit of it. Up until Epsilon now says, all right, what is this between us? This silver. And again, that statement is such a statement of respect where he says, uh, listen to me, my Lord. The land is worth 400, since you want to pay, it's worth 400 shekels of silver, but what is that between you and me? Respect. I don't even, I will let you have your way because you want to pay. But I also want to know that I don't want this to be between you and me. Ephron has seen this man, the integrity of this man. I don't even want him to think I'm really just dying for the shepherd too. The testimony of Abraham amongst this people is amazing. But Abraham, from this story we can see, he refuses to take anything that is not from God. Are we together? Anything that is not from God. And this is important for every man and the woman of faith. Stay focused on the promise until God delivers. Because he who has promised is faithful and he will deliver. Abraham could have very easily. God had promised his land. Hebron was part of the land. According to the promise, that land was already Abraham's anyway. But Abraham says, look, 
I will own it through the provisions of God. I have the silver and God that God has given me. I will pay for it. So I don't remain entangled with the right of the devil on our lives. You know the devil sometimes seeks to have a right, a footing in our lives that can even come in a way that looks very generous. I pray in Jesus' name that when the devil comes into you like an angel of light in that manner, particularly young people, as you begin to hook up with people and friends and, and, and your friends and things like that, you begin to see that the eyes of your understanding will be open to see that this is is a hoof in the sheepskin. Are you with me? Because had he taken that land for free, these guys would have turned around, even when his wife, it would have been tragic. He has buried his wife there. And who knows, they could have even come back, come around and say, oh no, no we, we, we now want to put on, we want to put, we want to put a mosque here. <laughs> and today as I'm speaking, actually that's where that mosque is, at Hebron. And that's why it's contagious. Because the Jews know Abraham's wife was buried here. This is the same mountain. This is the same rock where he sacrificed. That's their place. Abraham said, no. I'll pay for it. I'll use the provisions of God to own this land. He did not want to go in details and say to them, after all, all the land has been promised to me. But as for this piece of land only, I'll own it through buying and paying for it. So be careful. Be careful when you are dealing with the heavens. Abraham will not consent to own a foot of the ground without paying for it. And the second thing as well, he catechiously insists on taking nothing from the world though he is ready to take everything from God. Amen. He refuses. Beloved, these are some of, when we begin to walk in this integrity, then we know we are growing by faith. That even when, and I'm talking about experience, things that have been thrown before you, they look very good, glittery, gold and silver, and you are tempted to take it. But it's not from God. That's not God's way. God has said, Abraham, I'll give you the land. It's yours. Now these people who are encroachers, now they've got the right to even give. How can you give land that you're encroaching? Abraham understands everything. He says, no, I'll pay for it. He cuts off the bait of the enemy to come back and haunt him. So be careful in life. A man of faith keeps his integrity and takes nothing of the world and only goes 100% after the promise of God. No matter how long it takes, no matter how long it tarries, wait for it. God had promised him this land and no stratagem of the enemy, no temporary expedient will satisfy his heart. And this is an important thing, brother. Once you understand the promise of God, it doesn't matter how the enemy will try to come in and make it look nice. Now, nah. we'll stick with the promise of God. God has promised me one day, I will have a wife. I will have a husband. I will have a job. And therefore, when you see certain other things coming with strings attached, no. Nah. Nah. Now, I'll stick. That's the man of faith. It shows, this shows the independency of the faith we have in God. Amen. Amen. I know the economy is biting. There are people selling their bodies, 
because the economy is so difficult. People doing things like that, lying their way through because things are difficult. Trust the promise. Somebody say, trust the promise. Trust the promise. Trust and the promiser. And the promises. Amen. 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 I should go back on what I preached last time. <laughs> trust the promiser. Amen. Amen. He is faithful. He will deliver. It must come from God. Amen? Amen. It must come from who? God. From God. And until he does, Abraham insists, no, I will not take your offer. I will pay for it. I like this scripture as I close this. Hebrews chapter, chapter 10, verse 35. So do not throw away your confidence. For it has what? It will be richly rewarded. Richly. Not just rewarded, but richly rewarded. What, what, what is that piece of land that had a curve and a few trees compared to the whole promise of God for all his descendants and generations? What is it? It's nothing. This is what the enemy does. Temporal tangling of the carrot to cause us to throw it off. Don't throw away the confidence for it will be richly rewarded. The land and the promise after all was to his descendants. What you do today could ruin it for the com those coming after you. Amen? What you do today could ruin it for those coming after you. Thank you, Father Abraham, that you didn't ruin it for us. These guys had a strategy. They had a strategy. After all, Abraham had already learned one big lesson about doing it the worldly way, cutting corners. Can some of you remember what that lesson was? He had already learned a bitter lesson of doing things in the flesh. Ishmael. Ishmael. When his wife, Sarai, came to him and said, let's do it this way. God has said, I'll give you a promise. So why don't you do it this way? And Ishmael brought pain in the life of Abraham and Sarai. And up to this day, that pain is still there. Abraham was not going to do it again. He knew these guys. <laughs> he knew these guys. He knew who the highlights were. He says, no, I'm not touching anything of you guys. I'll wait for the fulfillment of the promise. And I will use what God has given me to pay for it. A man of faith. That's his life. Amen. Amen. And we all know that Abraham went on to die. And the only part of the land, the whole vast land, when he came out of the tent and God says, Abraham, open your eyes. How far can you see? If his old eyes, uh, I can see how far. I says, that's how far I'll give you the light. Now lift up your eyes to the heavens. How many stars can you see? Wow, this galaxy. Lord, I can't count them. That's how many descendants I'll give you. Now do you know that Abraham, out of all that expanse of the land, he died with only one title deed of it. Just that piece he paid for. But his descendants, on it all. Sometimes as a man of faith, it's not about just what we get out of it. In fact, if you read Hebrews chapter 11, almost all the great men and women of faith, they never even saw that promise. But they died standing on it and we, pro we have benefited out of it. That's why I said what you do today 
to affect those that are coming after you. Don't give up. Even though you live to see the fulfillment of that promise, it doesn't, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. God will fulfill it anyway. Because the Bible says, who has promises what? It's he will fulfill it anyway. Just every day of your life, stand. And it shall all be well. Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2. That's the last scripture for today. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Because by the end of the day, brothers and sisters, everything else that we may try to accumulate and gather to ourselves here, guess what will happen? We'll all leave it here. <laughs> and therefore, our faith should be fixed on things above. Things above. Just that one little bit of a lesson for us. God can show you an all expanse of all these beautiful things. Beautiful house and beautiful everything. You may not live in it, but those coming after you will. But by the end of the day, our treasure is where? In heaven. Well, I hope we have learned a few things of the life of the man of faith. He never stays down even when the chips are down. Even when you are passing through the valley of the shadow of darkness, you can still see that light and come out and follow that light. That's what he did. He was a man of integrity amongst the heathens. And he saw favor swing his way from the heathens. But he also never compromised. He never was tempted to touch anything of the world which was not from God. Don't touch it. The promise will bring it to pass, all of it. Amen. And this is the attitude that we must have. This is the state of mind that gives strength and grace and peace to all of us as we live the life of faith. Praise God. Amen. I hope that you've been blessed by this life of, of Abraham. The life of faith, his experiences, be encouraged and stay strong in the faith. Amen. So, Father, we just want to pray for for um, all of us, those who are here and those that are watching. We pray, dear God, that uh, let these truths from the life of Abraham also be imparted on our hearts. They are the truths about the life of the man of faith. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that let your word be hidden in our hearts and that it will strengthen us and that we will be pleasing unto you. We give you praise and the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, those of you that are following us. I hope you've enjoyed this teaching. And uh, we hope to see you again next week. Uh, tune in and uh, we'll, be, we'll be here. Amen.